My name is Prashanth Kumar, or PK, and I'm an MCAT tutor at Shamassian Academic Consulting. Today, we're going to be doing a passage walkthrough in the bio section. You should be taking roughly eight minutes on this passage, but today, we're going to be taking our time so you can see exactly what's going on in my head as we tackle this section. Let's get it. So I've gone ahead and put the passage on the left and the questions we're going through on the right. So feel free to take a moment and pause the video and come back to us. If not, let's get right into talking strategy. First, I like to maintain the same strategy for any passage. This makes sure that I have something to ground me, whether the passage is super easy or super challenging. I have something to come back to. Additionally, my strategy is read a paragraph, write a quick three to five word summary, then go on to the next paragraph, continue on and on and on. Doing this provides a little accountability for me. It makes sure I understand exactly what's going on in the paragraph before moving on to the next. Oftentimes I found myself reading an entire passage, not understanding anything, going on to the questions, and having to reread the entire thing. Doing this little check-in at the end makes sure I don't waste any time, and if I need to reread a paragraph, totally fine, much quicker than rereading the entire passage. The second little tip is I don't spend too much time on the figures on the first read. I don't know exactly what questions the test makers are going to ask, and to guess would be a waste of time. Instead, I sort of get a quick glance, big picture idea, then go on to the questions, and inevitably they'll tell us to come back to the passage itself if needed. Sometimes the questions won't ask about the passage or the figure. and then we wouldn't need to waste any time looking at the figure before going back. So with that, let's go right into it. POMC neurons in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, ARH, control energy homeostasis by sensing hormonal and nutrient cues and activating secondary malonocortin sensing neurons. Researchers identified the expression of a G-protein coupled receptor, GPR17, and the ARH and hypothesized that it contributes to the regulatory function of POMC neurons on metabolism. So the question I ask myself every single time is, what's happening? A basic understanding, nothing too detail oriented, the big picture understanding of exactly what's going on. And here, I see this sort of, we have like a GPCR, GPR17, and that is interacting with the POMC, neurons and that's interacting with metabolism okay so we have this sort of mechanism that it's talking about and this is the big picture understanding right we're not focusing on every detail we're not focused on anything draw symbols use abbreviation whatever helps you understand the big picture idea that's all we're going to focus on let's go on to the next paragraph in order to test this hypothesis Researchers generated POMC neuron-specific GPR-17 knockout, PGKO, mice, and determined their energy and glucose, metabolic phenotypes, on normal chow diet and high-fat diet. Okay, again, what's happening? So here we have an experiment, okay? And what's the experiment? GPCR knockout, so I'm just putting X, and then chow no chow or high fat whatever works for you and again big picture idea symbols whatever you need now we'll go on to the next in experiment one researchers measured body weight and weight gain of wt and pgko mice fed a high fat diet body weight was assessed at five months and ten months after the diet changed for adult mice the results from this experiment are shown in figure one and then it shows us a figure so I like to think of what is the big picture understanding? What is being changed and what's being looked at? So here, all I'm gonna say is body weight and weight gain. And these are our uh, dependent variables, right? This is what we're looking at. So that's like the main thing, takeaway from this paragraph. And then, right, like I said, I'm not spending too much time on the figure because I don't know if questions are gonna be asked. Next, we go on to the next paragraph. Neuropeptides from POMC neurons are known to play a role in appetite regulation. Alpha MSH is anorexigenic, while the effect of beta endorphin, beta EP, on sati satiety is context dependent. 
The bioavailability of alpha MSH and beta EP is partially determined by the expression of POMC and subsequent proteolytic processing by PC1, PC2, and CPE. Researchers measured alpha MSH, beta EP, and POMC neuropeptides in the medio basal hypothalamic samples from mice fed HFD for two weeks. Okay, so again, lots of details, lots of words, lots of symbols. We don't really want to focus on every single detail, right? We want to focus on the big picture. And that it comes down to these three ideas. We have alpha MSH, beta EP, and we want to talk about the POMC neurons and their role in appetite, right? Sort of something like that. We are trying to focus on the big hormones that are brought up as well as what neurons and what type of thing is brought up for the experiment, right? And that's what we'll see um, in, the next, in the next figure, right? We see these two diagrams looking at POMC neuropeptides and changes of different levels of alpha MSH and beta EP. Not gonna focus on that too much, right? We're just focusing on a big picture understanding of what's going on. And if a question asks us, we'll come back to it. And with that, we're done with our passage, right? We have a big picture understanding of, we have some experiments looking at different types of mice in different groups in different hormone levels. So with that, we can get right into questions. So I'll pull up question number one. Researchers hypothesize that PGKO mice maintain a low weight on a high fat diet by increasing beta oxidation. If this hypothesis is correct, which molecule might they expect to find at higher levels than wild type mice? A, pyruvate, B, acetyl-CoA, C, glucose 6-phosphate, or D, glucose 1-phosphate? All right, so this is a standalone question, meaning we don't have to go back into the passage to look for the answer, okay? So what is our key thing we're looking at, right? We're looking at beta oxidation. And what does beta oxidation do? Well, it takes fatty acids and makes them into what? Makes them into acetyl-CoA. This is something that you should remember from your sort of metabolism lectures and co from content review, right? When we're in these starvation points, we're gonna look for other ways to get energy and acetyl-CoA can go into the metabolic cycle. So right now we're taking fatty acids and going to acetyl-CoA, and this idea is what's happening? We're increasing beta oxidation. That means we're increasing this cycle. So that means our net output should be an increase in acetyl-CoA, right? We should be increasing the amount of fatty acids that are turning into acetyl-CoA. And so our answer should be B, right? This is the main takeaway of understanding like the big picture idea of what beta oxidation starts with and ends with, and then we can go from there. So with that, that's the, that's the understanding of that question, and we can go on to question number two. Based on figure two, which of the following conclusions is true? A, females have higher levels of POMC neurons. B, PKGO mice produce higher levels of neuropeptides. C, w -type, wild type females have higher levels of alpha MSH than wild type males. Or D, wild type males have higher levels of intracellular beta EP than wild type females. All right, so again, this is exactly the type of question I was looking for, right? One that points us to a figure, so we're gonna have to go back. Okay, and in this case, it wants us to go to figure two, or here. And before we take a look, let's think of what it's looking at, right? Ma male and female on the x-axis, and sort of these two hormones, alpha MSH and beta EP uh, on the y-axis, and we have two different groups of these males and females. We have wild type and PGKO. So with that, we, are, we have locked in on sort of the big picture understanding, and now we can look at our questions, right? So our answer choices. Females have higher levels of POMC neurons. Can we take this and with the, the figures shown below? We cannot, right? We're looking at changes in levels of POMC neuropeptide. It doesn't say anything about the number of neurons or the higher level of neurons. So we can cross A out. Oops. B, PKGO mice produce higher levels of neuropeptides. All right, so we have to look at PKGO, PGKO mice and compare them to wild type. So is in every case, right? It, we expect if it is an answer choice, it has to be in every case. 
Does it in every case produce higher levels of neuropeptides? Well, let's look. We For every case, we'd have to have this, 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 and this be true. And remember, whenever we have a figure and we're trying to compare our differences, we're looking for that statistical significance. And that's indicated by stars. So in this case, we have one star and three stars showing significant statistical significance. Um, but in every case, we don't have that statistical significance, right? Between these two, we don't see it. Between these two, we don't see it. Whereas in these two, we do see those stars. So this cannot be the answer choice because we don't see it in every case. So we can eliminate B. Wild type females have higher levels of alpha MSH than wild type males. Okay, so what are we looking at? We're looking at alpha MSH levels, right? And which graph is that? That is this first graph, the alpha MSH. And we're looking at whether wild type females have higher levels than wild type males. So wild type, what color is it? That's the white bar. So this one, is that greater than the wild type males? And yes, we see that statistical significance. We see those three stars. And so this is exact situation of something that is true, right? We see that wild type females have higher levels of alpha MSH than wild type males. Let's just look at D real quick. Wild type males have higher levels of intracellular beta EP than wild type females. Okay, we're looking at intracellular beta EP, right? And so that's the second one. And so we should look at wild type males, right? We're looking again at the, the white graph, the white bars. And do we see a relationship between wild type males and wild type females? No, there is no statistical significance between the two. So we can cross that out. And with that, we have C, we're two for two, great work. All right, question number three. Researchers are interested in studying a new G protein coupled receptor, GPCR, called GPCR84. Which of the following mutations may researchers in do introduce to the protein to decrease GPCR signaling? Mutate the alpha subunit of GPCR84 so that it is locked in a GDP bound form. B, mutate the alpha subunit of a GPCR84 so that it is locked in a GTP bound form. C, add an agonist ligand that bound, binds to GPCR84. Or D, express GPCR84 on cellular surfaces that are spatially close to agonist ligands. Okay, so this one's a challenging question, but we have to know exactly what we're talking about. And that is GPCR, a very important type of receptor. I highly recommend you review. And so what is the idea of this GPCR signaling or GPCR signaling cascade is that we have our GPCR alpha, like our alpha subunit. And this is an important part. And so I'm just gonna draw that here. I'll put it in a different color. The alpha is usually bound to ADP, okay? And so at this point, when it's bound to ADP, or sorry, not ADP, my mistake, GDP, when it's bound to GDP, it's locked in. Nothing is happening. It's limiting the amount of signaling when this is, when this is occurring. But when we have our friend GTP come in, the GTP is going to kick out that GDP and bind to it. So then we're going to have alpha GTP. And then what happens? Increased signaling. Okay. So when it's bound to GDP, we have decreased signaling. When we're bound to GTP, it's unlocked, increased signaling, and it's going to continue. All right. So with that, let's think, right? We want what? We want a decrease in GPCR84 signaling. Okay. So which of the following is going to give us a decrease, right? Well, if we mutate the alpha subunit of GPCR84, so that's locked in a GDP bound form, what do we say? When we have GDP bound to it, it's going to be locked in that configuration. It's not going to be able to signal. So right away, A seems like our best bet. But let's just take a look at B. Mutate the alpha subunit of GPCR84 so that it is locked in a GTP bound form. Well, like we said, if GTP bound is bound, then we're gonna have increased signaling. We're gonna have that increased level in that of intracellular signaling, which will allow more and more, um, more and more signaling to occur. So we can eliminate B, and you can see A and B are sort of the same answers, but with mildly different sort of parts to it, whether it's GDP or GTP bound. Add an agonist ligand that binds to GPCR84. 
Well, if we have an agonist ligand, right? Agonist means we're gonna have increased expression, right? Agonist and an antagonist, however, would decrease expression. So we're gonna eliminate C. Express GPCR84 on cellular surfaces that are spatially close to agonist ligands, right? If we put them close to agonist ligands, we'd expect there to be increased um, intracellular signaling. So we're gonna cross that out and we're left with A, our first answer choice, and we've done it. Three for three, great work. On to question number four. Researchers observe a surge in alpha MSH immediately after eating along with which other hormone? A, insulin, B, glucagon, C, somatostatin, or D, norepinephrine. All right, another standalone question. So we don't have to look back into the passage, we just have to understand what hormones are gonna occur when. And this is a very, very high yield topic on the MCAT, understanding hormones, right? So when you eat food, right, what is gonna happen? We're gonna have a sudden increase in insulin because we have sort of energy available. We have food available to turn into, to turn into this metabolic cycle, to, uh, to turn into ATP long-term. So we have in increased insulin. What is the opposite, the sort of antagonist hormone of insulin? We're gonna have decreased levels of glucagon, okay? So insulin and glucagon are sort of these opposites. When you have increased insulin, you're gonna have decreased glucagon and vice versa. And these are probably the two biggest hormones with glycolysis and understanding the metabolic cycle that you're gonna, you're gonna see. So right away with that, after you eat, what are you gonna see? We're gonna have a spike of insulin so A is our best answer. And we're not gonna affect, our glucon levels are not gonna increase, they're gonna actually decrease. So now let's go on to C and D just to see what's going on. Somatostatin. Somatostatin actually is this outside uh, hormone that inhibits both insulin and glucagon. So that really would not be uh, relevant to our answer choice, so we're gonna eliminate C, right? And then norepinephrine. Well, norepinephrine is released in sort of the fight and flight adrenaline response, right? And so this occurs when digestion is halted, but not really related to an immediately after eating. So we're gonna eliminate D, and there we have it, four for four. This understanding of hormones, especially insulin and glucagon, very, very important. So spend some time studying that. All right, and we're on to our final question. Question number five. In the high fructose diet, or a uh, high fat diet, researchers feed mice unsaturated fats. Which of the following represents a fat with the most double bonds? Is it A, 18-1 delta 9, B, 18-2 delta 9-12, C, 28-1 delta 17, D, 28-3 delta 9-17-23? So this idea is, uh, is important. It's the sort of naming sort of classification type of thing of hydrocarbons. And so how do we sort of label them, right? So we have three sort of numbers. We have one, we have sort of our first number, our second number, a delta, and our third number, okay? So this is an important idea of our first number represents what? The number of carbons, okay? So in these 18 and 28 cases, it represents 18 carbons or 28 carbons in this carbon chain. What does the second number represent? Oops. The second number represents the number of double bonds. Okay? So the number of double bonds is this. So if you have 18 carbons and then we have colon one, right? I'll put the colon there. Then we have 18 carbons with one double bond. 18 two, 18 with two double bonds. And then delta is the sort of initiator that tells us exactly where the double bonds are, okay? So after this, this tells us location of double bonds. And so if it says nine, there'll be a double carbon, or a double bond off carbon nine, uh, nine, 12, double bonds off carbon nine and carbon 12. And so here, we're looking for the carbon with the most double bonds. And based on this nomenclature, we should be able to easily figure out which one that is. And that is this guy, D, right? Because it has three double bonds, as it tells us right there, and it even tells us exactly where our uh, double bonds are. And so with that, we can eliminate A, B, and C. 
because they only have one, two, one double bond, and we're good to go. We crushed it. Five, five. Some challenging questions, but great work. We crushed it. Another bio passage in the books. Super challenging dealing with hormones, experimental design, reading plots, and we did it all. Hopefully that hammered out some weaknesses and taught you exactly how to navigate these experimental passages. If you like this video, give us a like down below and subscribe to our channel and comment exactly what types of passage walkthroughs and videos you're looking forward to next. Additionally, check out our 528 strategy series by Vikram, super helpful series to help you navigate any type of passage. And also check out the link in our bio for our MCAT practice question of the day so you don't miss out on any studying before test day. Happy studying and let's get it.